Hey writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Laura, Kobo Writing Life's author and engagement manager. And I'm Rachel, the promotion specialist at Kobo Writing Life. Today, we spoke to Mary Adkins, who's a former lawyer turned writing coach, author, and podcast host. She has released three novels and works with other authors to write, revise, and pitch their novels in her program, Book Incubator. We had such an interesting conversation with Mary as she told us how her own struggles to finish the first draft of her first novel led her to becoming a writing coach and creating her program, Book Incubator. She honestly gave like some really big spoilers as to what authors can expect if they sign up for her program and gave really cool insights into her own writing process. We also talked to her about her podcast that she's a host on. We talked to her about her newsletter. And she also told us about her newest project, which is a memoir that she is indie publishing. And it's just so interesting how her writing process has shifted now that she's writing something that is so much closer to home. Again, this was such an interesting conversation, and we hope you all get as much out of it as we did. We are joined today by author and writing coach, Mary Adkins. Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. So glad to be joining you. To kick us off, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I live in Nashville. I have a husband and a son who's four and a half named Finn and no pets. I have lived here since 2019. We we lived in New York before. I lived in New York for a really long time. And I yeah, I'm an I'm a novelist. I'm actually a former lawyer too. I I was a lawyer very very briefly and then left the law to try to launch a writing career and, and ultimately did. I have a, a few novels out, three novels that you maybe can find in your local bookstore. They have been there at one time, if not now, <laughs> but you can definitely find online. And when I'm not writing, I, I teach writing. So I work with authors who are working on books, mostly novelists, but also people working on memoirs. Before we get into your writing and your coaching career, I wanted to talk a little bit about the journey you mentioned going from lawyer to author. So how did that jump kind of begin? So I have always loved school. I was like one of those kids that just really loved learning. I still do. So I loved law school. I went went to law school because I had always been interested in the law. But when I graduated from law school and started working as a lawyer, it was very different than being in law school. (laughs) Go figure. And um, it really was, it was kind of a wake up call for me because I, I had always loved writing, like creative writing so much. And I had really always wanted, like, that's what was, what my soul wanted to do basically, you know, like I feel like many writers were like this, but I had just sort of quashed that or I had thought, oh, I'll write on the side. I'll write at night. And being a lawyer in a way was a gift because it was such a busy job that I didn't have time to write at night. So I I really had, if I wanted to make writing a part of my life, I really had no choice but to leave that profession. And so it kind of made it easy for me in a way, like an easy decision, because I knew that I wanted to make time to write. That was going to be my priority. And so I left law only seven months after starting as a lawyer. Like I was a really, really short, shortly tenured lawyer. (laughs) And I got a job tutoring, tutoring freelance. And I, for the next, I mean six or so years, I think, until I I got my first book deal and started teaching creative writing. I was juggling tutoring, tutoring people in like graduate level exams, like the LSAT for law school and the GRE and the SAT and writing. So I would tutor at night and write during the day, just working on working on that first novel for quite a number of years. I will say, I really appreciate the optimism that you had that you would be a practicing lawyer and have time to write creatively at night. I know, so delusional. (laughs) That's so interesting though, because like one common thread that we see a lot when we're talking to authors is a history in law. And I find it so fascinating. And a lot of authors will say it's because when you are practicing law, especially if you're a courtroom lawyer, you have to build a story. And so those creative elements are there, but I still find the crossover fascinating. I do too. I think it's really fascinating. And I don't know where that crossover starts. Like if it is that that writers often sort of get shoehorned into law because it's, you know, it's like something we tend to be able to take on pretty well. Like it's a lot of reading and writing and that's what we like doing anyway. Like I think part of it is that. And then also 
Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of story overlap. Like there's a lot of story in the law. That's really fascinating. Like cases, I always, in law school, I loved reading cases because they were all stories. Like it always starts with a story of someone who has a problem, you know? Just, it's so interesting. I don't know. But kind of continuing on the topic of your journey towards becoming a book coach, one of your multi-hyphenates is that you are a book writing coach. And so you have left the law, you're tutoring, you're writing your first book. What was it like moving from kind of struggling with writing your own first draft to helping others achieve their writing dreams. It was super fun. The way that it happened was I, my first book was coming out. It's called When You Read This. And I went on a little book tour or not so little, actually 12, 12 stops, like physical stops, not even virtual. Um, This was pre-pandemic and um, did this book tour going to 12 different bookstores in some different, in different cities, not all different cities, but a lot of different cities. And whenever I would start talking about my book and I would share about my process, there would be people there who would ask about the process. They would want to know, like, how do I write a book? Where do I start? How do I get a book deal? And as I would answer these questions, I realized that over the previous six years, I had actually, I had through trial and error, figured out a lot of things that like could be helpful to somebody who found themselves in my shoes six years earlier. And so not long after that book came out, just a couple months, really, I was I was also a new mom at the time. So I was pushing my kid in the stroller while he napped. I was just taking a stroll. And I thought, oh, I what if I like make my little on make, make my own online course on how to write a novel draft, a first draft. That was all I took on at first was a first novel draft. So I Googled like how to make an online course. And I ended up, I don't even remember how I found those first students, but I ended up with like a first cohort of students going through my course, which I called the 12 week book draft, or maybe it was the 12 week novel draft back then, but it worked. Like I walked them through writing their novel drafts and they did it which was awesome. And they were excited and I was excited. And then they were like, now how do we revise? (laughs) So I was like, guess I should, we should do that next. So then I made a little revision kind of curriculum and we went through revising and then they were like, how do we pitch? And so I put together pitch materials for people who want to get traditionally published. And that was really how I, I kind of fell into it. And now, now I have a program called the book incubator where I walk them through all of those steps. So writing the first draft, revising it, revising it again, and then deciding what publishing route you want to take and then helping them navigate that whichever direction they decide to go. So it's become, it's, it's really grown to this much more comprehensive program, which is super fun. So I I love doing that, but I never would have, I never set out to do that, but I lo- now that I do do it, I love it. I love it as much as writing. And just to make sure all of our listeners are on the right page, can you kind of explain just in layman's terms what a book coach is? Sure. Yeah. I also didn't know what that was till I became one. (laughs) But it's basically just like, you know, if you were to be a professional athlete, you would have a coach. You would have like someone helping you get better and, and to just be there to kind of to both be your cheerleader and your guide. And that's how I think of my role. Like I'm a guide who's saving, I'm saving writers time by telling them like, Hey, for me, this route has not worked that well. What if we try this or based on the kind of book you're writing or based on your personality type? What if you try this both in terms of like writing goals every day, but also in terms of craft, like, Oh, this is the genre you're writing. Here's what we need to achieve. Like, how are we going to get there? So really I'm kind of like, I'm like the wedding planner for their book. (laughs) But also their cheerleader, you know, being like, you can do this. We can do this. We can get it done. Because I really do think of my goal as like to help them get to the finish line and to make it good, you know, to help them make it good, to ask them the right questions and give them the right prompts to help them write their strongest book. So that's how I think of book coaching is, is um, you know, I don't know a lot about sports, but <laughs> I do think of it as comparative to a coach in sports. Have you had to do a lot of research or trial and error with your own writing process to kind of uncover different methods to work with different writers? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think that was where I didn't even kind of realize that that I had sort of amassed a bunch of experiential knowledge. But yeah, I took writing classes over those six years that I was working on my first book. I took so many writing classes. I was constantly in at least one class. And some of them would be great and others would be truly terrible. And I would realize like, oh, you know, this is some, for example, something I uncovered that definitely did not work for me. And so is not how I work with writers now is the feedback based model, where as soon as you start writing any draft pages, you immediately subject them to feedback 
particularly from your peers. <laughs> so that always squashed my spirit. Always. I never left those feeling good. I always felt burdened by like a million things I was doing wrong and needed to do differently. And I would lose my vision for the story. I would lose all my excitement about writing. And so it was really clear to me when I started, like, I'm not going to do it that way because I don't actually think that was ever helpful for me. And in fact, I think I finally found my voice and I finally figured out what the story was that I wanted to tell in that first novel when I stopped listening to all that peer feedback. So there are some things that I intentionally do for everybody because they have become kind of defining principles for me just as a person. And I'm not gonna, like, I don't really make exceptions to that. Like in my program, you you don't get feedback from your peers in the program. And that is very intentional and that's true for everyone. But there are other things that are a lot more flexible. Like I'm not an outliner, but I've worked with some writers who love outlining. And so I'm not going to tell them not to outline. Of course, like, of course not if it's working for them. So it's much more about like what helping the writer see, like what makes you want to write? What makes it fun for you? What makes you productive? What makes you want to show up and do it? Because that's what we want to lean into. And for some people that will be outlining and for some people it won't. So it kind of, it depends on the, what the thing is, you know? You mentioned that kind of pit that you get when you get that negative feedback from your peers and how it kind of threw off your writing process. How do you help authors kind of find the balance between critique and trusting themselves? That's such a good question. So I talk a lot about getting it from the right people at the right time. Like the right time is rarely, if ever, going to be as you are writing a first draft. And in that case, in the case where it would be the right time, it would definitely need to be the right person. Like someone who knows how to give feedback to a writer, probably as a writer themselves or a professional editor who knows where you are in the drafting process, who isn't going to come in and be like, I don't like Ethan. <laughs> I don't like your character. Why don't you set this in California? Why is this set in North Carolina? Like that kind of stuff just isn't helpful. And it's derailing. And so the way that I teach it is that the proper, and which is the same way that I do it, which is that like, there's a time, there's a time and place where it becomes really essential. Actually, the, you know, the feedback's really essential, but it tends to be after the writer has figured out what the thing is that they're writing, like they've executed a version of it, uh, uh, they, they executed their vision, they have some version of it. And so they know what it is before we start kind of attacking it. So for me, that's often after one full revision, not even after the first draft. It's like, there's a first draft. Now I've gone in and revised at least once, fix the things I see that I think need fixing. And now is time to introduce outside opinions. And then at that point, I think it can be really helpful to get feedback from trusted reader. It doesn't have to be a writer, a fellow writer, you know, like a trusted reader, but maybe not like your most critical friend. <laughs> maybe not like the person you sometimes I'll tell you, like, don't go to the person, you know, just hates everything just because you're feeling in a masochistic mood or because you or because you like have this the hope that like, this will be the one thing they like, you know, I feel like we write like writers, we do that kind of weird stuff sometimes <laughs> out of, I don't know what that is, fear, but like go to someone who you really do think will give you very fair and honest feedback, but not like unnecessarily brutal feedback because that's not going to be helpful either. And I also assume that when you're looking for this feedback, you shouldn't go to somebody like your mom who is just going to love and gold star everything yeah. you do. Right. Same. Exactly. Not like the person who's just going to be like, that's incredible. But also not, you know, it's funny too, because sometimes, you know, writers say, well, I, like, okay, I wrote this fantasy novel and I'm really struggling because I gave it to my brother and he hated it. He hated my fantasy novel. I'm like, now I don't want to keep writing. And I'll be like, so what is your brother like does your brother like to read fantasy no he my brother hates fantasy you're like that's why he hated your fantasy novel like <laughs> you can't give your romance novel to your husband who would never read romance and then be disappointed that he didn't like it like if you don't like grapefruit you're not gonna like grapefruit soda you know <laughs> so i think there's also that's an important thing to take into consideration too like ideally you want to give it to someone who's read in that genre before. And I know that we don't all have, you know, a million friends to choose from, but this is where I think like in, in my program, people swap manuscripts and we facilitate that. So you're swapping with someone who is a good match for you, who's going to read what you've written with a sensitive eye. And I think that's a great place to find, like in a writing community, finding a fellow writer to read your work. 
but uh, yeah, if not that, then at least someone in your life, ideally, who is a reader would be good. Yeah, that's such a good idea because writing can be really isolating. So I love the idea of them having like you as the guide, but then also like the cohort that they can kind of go through the journey with together. That's really great. Yeah, it just feels because you're right. It's so solitary. So it just makes it feel, I think, less lonely when you know other people are at least on parallel tracks with you. (laughs) One thing I wanted to touch on, and you kind of alluded to this, on your website, you mentioned that you started writing the book you thought you should write based on just like the constant feedback cycle versus the book that you wanted to write. I'm really curious about your thoughts about writing to market and writing what's popular versus writing what you're passionate about. Yeah, I've become like for most people, pretty anti-writing to market. And I say for most people, because I know there are definitely some people who are that rare species of like really finding their groove with truly just writing what they think people want to consume. And they are fine with that. And they are fine with it, like operating on that level and they don't need to go deeper. And they're just like, it's almost like a mercenary kind of like, I'm just gonna, I'm doing this so that I can make money and I'm good with that. And that's, I think I'm kind of in awe of those people, honestly. I'm like, that's amazing if you can really come at it with that approach and do it successfully. But I I just, I find that that's not the most common writer. Like the, the more writers have sort of a soul book that they're like, right? They, they have this burning book in them. It feels personal. It feels, it, it's like coming from a place kind of beyond themselves. It's been like, sometimes they, they like, by the time I start working with them, they're like, I've been thinking about this for literally 20 years in one case, 30 years. So I think when that's the book people want to write, I think writing to market can become meaning, like trying to shape it into something people are going to buy or that you think is commercial can really squash the creative spark, which is not to say that, you know, it's like, it's a balance, right? So like, if somebody does want to traditionally publish their book, they're going to have to get a publisher to buy it. So it's like, okay, if they're like, I have this book in me, Mary, and how do I write it so that someone will buy it from me so that a publisher will buy it from me? I'm going to tell them some general guidelines that I think are going to be the most important, like word count, you know? So if like you're writing a memoir, like you can't submit a 200,000 word memoir to Simon and Schuster and think they're going to buy it. Like it's too long. Same with a 20,000 word memoir. That's going to be too short. So it's like, okay, so let's shoot for about 70, maybe 80,000 words. That's going to be the sweet spot. A little longer is fine, but again, not 200,000. So like there will be some kind of parameters that are important to consider, but I think that's really different. Like length, for example, is really different than let me write what book is going to sell right now. Like, um, I've heard that sometimes a writer will come to me and say something like, I've heard that I need to have a 16 year old protagonist (laughs) set in this time period and place experiencing a blah, blah, like a coming of age story. Then that is what's going to sell. And it's like, that's insane. That's like, (laughs) I mean, and you know, not to insult the person who's saying that, but like that idea is of course, like, that's like thinking like, I'm going to have a successful restaurant by like using, you know, by doing this exact recipe or whatever. It just doesn't, it, ha- it there's a lot more magic involved than that, I think. I was just going to say, I really like the way you put it, that there's more magic in something like that. Because I do feel that sometimes when you're trying to force yourself to write something you're not passionate about, it just makes the whole process so much harder. And I'm saying this is like a non-writer, but as somebody who reads a lot, I just feel like it becomes so much harder. Like if you don't like vampire novels, but you've heard that vampires are making a comeback, you're probably not going to have a good time writing the next Twilight. No, exactly. And it makes it, you're right. It's so much harder on yourself. It's like going on a date with someone you don't like, (laughs) like you're not going to have a good time and it's going to feel long and you're probably not going to be that charming. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. And I've said this before. I think when you're writing to market. Sometimes if it's not something that you're really passionate about, it comes out in your writing because it is harder. And then sometimes readers can tell that it's not something you're passionate about. Like maybe it doesn't have like the right, the right voice that you would if you really cared about it. So that's something to keep in mind as well when making that decision. I completely agree. I completely agree. It's like that intangible quality 
like the writing falls flat in my experience. And I say this from my experience, like I do, uh, when I have done this, like I do, I go back and look at the writing and it does feel like it's lacking that it's lacking that spark because I didn't feel it as I was writing it. Do you have kind of like a stumbling block that you find is common with your writers when they're starting out? Yes. And it is permission. Like I work with so many writers who need permission to write a novel, which I totally get because I was in the same boat. So to go back to my story, like I quit my job, my law job to be a writer, but I thought I was going to be a writer of nonfiction because I truly did not believe that I was capable of writing fiction. I had no confidence. I had zero confidence. And I, in fact, I, I put together an entire book proposal for a nonfiction book and I was submitting it to literary agents, emailing them, submitting it. And one of them wrote back and said, I can't sell this, but do you have a novel? And I actually did have a novel idea. I had also heard the advice, never tell someone no no if they ask if you had something else. So I thought, I can't say no. So I said, well, I don't have the novel, but here's an idea for a novel that I've had. And he wrote back and said, I love that idea. Write it and send it to me. And that was my permission slip to try to be a novelist. And I'm so grateful this person never became my literary agent, but I'm so grateful to him now because he really is the reason I became a novelist. Like he gave me permission to try. And I feel like that's what I do for so many writers now. I work with, I mean, you mentioned lawyers a second ago. I work with so many lawyers who like find me because they are like secretly Googling. <laughs> they they find my website because they are secretly Googling like how to write a novel. They haven't told anyone they want to write one. They're a little bit embarrassed. They like feel like they're not capable of it. And then they do it and it's really good, but not just lawyers, lawyers, teachers, a few people in the medical field minister, a couple of ministers, but people who tend to, most of the people I work with are professionals in other areas. And they have had this book idea either recently or a long time ago, but there's very, not always, but very often a small part of them that really does need to be given permission before they'll let themselves do it. Like you can do this and you're not silly for trying. And it's worth trying. It's worth finding the time to do it. And then I often find like, once they get that, a lot of times they just, they're like, I wrote 30,000 words this week. (laughs) Like they're just, it's fun. You know, they're like, go this like skiing downhill. My next question is a little bit selfish because this is something I struggle with, but how do you help writers who have that idea? Who are like, I got a great idea for a story. Here we go go from idea to a fully fleshed out novel because an idea is only like the back cover copy and you need a lot more of that for a book. Right. So I I teach a method that I used for myself for not, not for my first novel, my first novel, like I said, took me six years to write. So that was a lot of trial and error, but for my second novel, I did use this and then I used it again for my third, which is called the four notebooks method. And it's just a way of basically breaking down. First of all, it's writing by hand, which I should say at the top, because that is, I know that's weird. A lot of people don't do that. Um, But I do teach writing by hand because that is what I do. And writing a novel draft by hand across four notebooks, because four notebooks will, if you do it the way that I like to teach, which is like writing on a hundred pages and roughly 120 to 140 to 180-ish words a page, So basically you'd have to get a notebook that has, I forget which is sheets and which is pages. (laughs) Like if you're writing on the fronts of all of the sheets, it's 100 pages. So it'd be like a 200 page or sheet notebook. I again, forget how they market it, but like a bigger notebook for me, it's, that is what the, like an extra large moleskin for that, that brand would be that notebook. If you write on the front pages of four notebooks, so 400 pages total, that often, unless you have insanely big handwriting or insanely tiny handwriting (laughs) that will often end up being a good length for a book. Like it'll be anywhere from 70 to a hundred thousand words, which is really solid for, for an adult novel or memoir. And then each notebook, I give a kind of like an assigned story role. So like in the first notebook, we're fleshing out a problem that the main character has. In the second notebook, we're trying to solve that problem. In the third notebook, um, I call that the big drop. It's like where the solution doesn't work and like there's some kind of comeuppance. And then in the fourth notebook, which I sometimes call that the wild, wild west, because that's when I like, it's really fun to let the characters take over and just like tell you what they have figured out. 
So, yeah. So I have like a loose structure that I like to share in case people want to do that. And there's also a way to, you know, you can basically use that concept even if you want to type and do it digitally. Like you don't have to do the notebooks by hand, but most people do if they can physically because it is freeing. And there's a lot of research that shows that handwriting taps into the same parts of our brain that are active when we're reading, which I think is really, really cool because it, but typing doesn't, because I think I found that to be true that like writing by hand does feel closer to reading than typing does for me. I don't know if you all relate to that at all, but I found some science behind that, which I thought was really interesting. So not all writers are going to use that method. You know, like um, I definitely have people in the program who are like, um, I don't quite want to conform my story to that structure. It's built around the three X structure, which is not how everyone wants to structure their story. But a lot of writers do find it like a helpful kind of template to start out with because it's not too prescriptive. You know, there are a lot of templates out there that are super prescriptive, like 15 beats or, you know, that are really like break it down. So it's not to that level, but it does give some structure so that it doesn't feel like, yeah, like I have a story premise and nothing else. And I'm just going to go and see what happens. Like that's for me, that's because that's how I wrote my first novel, but I, I then had to rewrite it about 20 times. So like, I think it's a, for many of us, I think that's like a little bit too much freedom. I think the handwriting thing is really cool. Do you ever have any trouble understanding what you've written though, as somebody who has horrifically messy penmanship sometimes? So I don't, which is why I think I didn't realize that that would be a thing. People, that's a problem. Yeah. And I feel terrible. Like I've worked with a couple of writers who are like, um, I can't read what I wrote. What do I do? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I should have seen that coming too. I mean, <laughs> one solution that we've come up with is like, and this actually works well for a lot of people is instead of handwriting the whole thing and then transcribing, they transcribe at the end of every day or every writing session. And that helps because they do kind of remember. So it just helps decipher. Because yeah, if two months have gone by and you look back, you're like, I have no idea what that says. I don't remember writing that. <laughs> I also love the handwriting idea. It's nice because it's kind of like going back to when you're in school and you got to like handwrite all your writing and stuff. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like a little bit of like that inner child. But also I think it's good because I find sometimes when we try and do NaNoWriMo, I'm constantly distracted by everything on my computer. So it's good to just like handwrite and not look at anything else that's going Same. on around you. You don't have like the alerts popping up. Yes, exactly. And being like, I'm just going to check my, or in my case, I can blame it on alerts, but it really it's me. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to check my email right now. <laughs> We also wanted to talk about your newsletters a little bit. So you send out your bi-weekly newsletter to your mailing list, which includes a sneak peek of your writing process. So what is your writing process like and why did you decide to share this so publicly? Like what exactly do you share in the newsletter? So I found that when I, in my program, would give some behind the scenes. So uh, for example, I'll teach the four notebooks method and um, tell people what to do. And then they'll be like, can you show us an example? And so I'll like take a photo of my notebook, my handwritten notebook and turn it into a PDF and share my screen. And when I've done that, people are like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful to see, which, you know, makes sense to me now that I think about it, just in the same way that I love seeing like writers first drafts. I mean, I think there's something that's so disarming about it because you realize like, oh, this is messy. Like, even though I can read my own handwriting, it's still messy. Right. And it's like just words on a page and there are things crossed out and like placeholders. And so I think there's something about seeing that that seems to give people that permission. They feel like, okay, this isn't anything like, like it doesn't start out, you know, polished. And so I just try to share more of that, like more of that kind of permission giving behind the scenes stuff more widely through my newsletter. Like that's how I do that. And when you're sharing kind of the behind the scenes look on your writing process, are you also giving your mailing list like an exclusive sneak peek on what you're working on now? Or is this previous drafts of your already published books? Sometimes. Often it's previous drafts of already published books. Most of the time it's that because of honestly, like what we just talked about with feedback, like with whatever I'm presently working on, it's so vulnerable and raw that I kind of 
I usually don't want to open it up to like, I don't want anyone to tell me what they think because I will take that to heart. <laughs> like I will, I will let it shape the direction of the thing. And I don't know that I often am like, I don't know that I want you to be able to shape the direction of the thing. I don't even know what the thing is yet, you know? So often it's like, yeah, it is backward looking. It's like, here's an example of, cause I save all of my drafts. So it'll be like, here's an example of a second draft or like once I shared the first few draft openings of my second novel, like here was my first draft opening. Here's the second version I wrote. Here's the third version. So the, and, and here's the final version. So they could look and compare, but I didn't share that until after that novel had come out. I really want to get into what you're working on now, but just before we jump into that, when you're not busy writing or book coaching. You're also the host on two podcasts or co-host on one host of the other. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about them? Yes. So um, one of them is called the first draft club and that's just me just solo, like sharing writing advice. And it's really fun. And I, yeah, traditionally it's just been me like sharing some tips. And I say traditionally, cause I think in the next season, we're taking a little break right now, but I think in the next season, it is going to be more behind the scenes, like a little bit more, like, let me talk to you about what I'm working on now and how that's going and why I'm doing it this way, et cetera. And then the other podcast is called craft talk book club. And that is where my friend, Nicole and I, Nicole is a fellow writer um, and author and she, and writing coach actually, and she and I read books. We she she's a nonfiction gal, so we swap every other month. We do fiction. Every other month we do nonfiction, and we pick like a recently published novel or memoir, and we dissect the craft choices that the author made. It's so fun and nerdy, and I love it. It's just we really. It's basically we started that one because we realized we were doing that anyway. Like we would read, we would basically have a two person book club, but one focused on craft, where we would read a book and talk about what the author did. And since we're both writing coaches, at one point it was like, should we? This should just be a podcast. <laughs> Let's just turn our conversations into a podcast. And so that's what we did. Yeah, it must be hard to kind of turn that writing coach off when you're reading. So you might as well use it for some podcast exactly. content. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Is there one piece of craft advice you've uncovered through the process of Craft Top Book Club and how has it kind of changed your approach to writing? Oh, yeah. So the most recent book that we analyzed is a memoir um, published by a Canadian author, Rowan McCandless is her name. And she has this beautiful memoir called Persephone's Children that actually has won a few awards in Canada. And it's really unconventional in that it's a collection of essays. It's like a memoir in essays and they are hermit crab essays. So that's if someone, if a listener doesn't know, a hermit crab essay is when you take a subject and you you write an essay about it taking on the form of something else. So like you could write an essay about a relationship, but in the form of like a report card or a doctor's note or um, an application for a mortgage or, you know, like any, anything goes. And that's how her collection works. So she has a word search. She has a quiz. She has a little, a play. There's a script in there. And it was really fun to read that book and discuss it with, with Nicole on our podcast. And it also has really opened me up to, I, I had a conversation with the writers in my program this week about how we can all be more open to forms and exploring different forms in our work. So not just feeling like, oh, it just needs to be traditionally narrated prose, you know, like third person, he did she did they they said so that was really cool and I'm still thinking a lot about that book that book sounds incredible and I will be adding it to my to read list I love books that have like interesting form because it just makes the reading process so much more fun yeah um, and it flies by like you read it so you'll read it in a sitting basically I did because it's like there's just so much there are drawings or illustrations it's really cool yeah I loved it and just to touch on the other podcast first of all the first draft club is an excellent name for a podcast. Thank you. Like, I love it. Do you have a piece of advice for writers who are currently struggling through that, like just dreaded first draft? Yes. My favorite piece of advice is to save editing for later. Just don't edit as you go. You don't need to that. Sometimes I'll tell people like your editor is not good yet. They're like on the job training. Like they don't need responsibility yet. They haven't, they don't know what the story is yet that, that they're editing. So they're just not good at their job yet. Like they don't have the qualifications. So don't let, don't like, don't give them the scalpel, you know, like let them watch. They just need to be watching, even though they're really eager. And usually that 
if people stop editing as they go on a first draft, usually people end up writing the first draft a lot more quickly than they were when they were trying to edit as they go. And that is also really confidence building and momentum building. And and it makes for a better first draft, I think, because once because then they can really get in the flow without like overthinking every sentence or wondering about their word choice, because all of that will come later. And I try to reassure writers of that, like you're going to have a chance to come through with your edit editor voice and like tweak and refine. You'll have that chance. It just, it's like the next phase. It, it, you don't want to do it at the same time as you're really just trying to like, like let creativity be in the lead and just get those words on paper. Yeah. I think it's really hard to remember that no one is going to see this first draft, but you. Like yeah. first draft is like a, for your eyes only. And then you can go in, make some revisions that make you comfortable to share it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's really hard to turn off like that. Like you said, the inner editor's voice, but it really is so important because like Rachel said, no one's going to see the first draft, but you. And there's this quote that says the first draft is really just getting the words onto the page. And mm-hmm. that's so true. Like you just want to get it all out there and then you can go through and edit later, but it's way easier said than done. Way easier said than done. I love that. And I've also heard the phrase, the first draft is like you telling yourself the story, which I also really like. You have three published books out now. So how has your writing process evolved with each book? Well, the first one was just a hot mess. I mean, as I mentioned, like it took me six years and I... I wrote it stream of consciousness. I just didn't have any, which in the look, I don't regret that, but like I learned through trial and error, but I, I probably rewrote it 20 times. And then the second one I wrote with a newborn at home. So I wrote re- like a brand newborn, like five weeks old. So I really didn't have the same kind of luxury of time. Like I probably only had two hours a day to write because that's when I had childcare. So I had to get a lot more efficient. It was also when I developed the four notebooks method. Because the, for the first time, I found that like I would stare at a computer screen and go blank, which had never happened to me before on my first book. So it was just a new experience. But I was very intimidated by a computer screen. So I started handwriting because it felt less daunting and found that I could actually handwrite. And that's why I ended up handwriting that novel. And then that worked so well, handwriting, that I by choice, hand wrote the third novel. So I wasn't, by the time I wrote my third novel, I wasn't as intimidated by the computer screen. Like that anxiety had gone away, but I had just loved handwriting. So I just went right back to it. So it was all really different. The first, actually the second and third novel were very similar, but the first novel was a really different experience. And is this handwriting method something that you are currently employing on your uh, next project? No, actually. So that was also interesting. So my current thing I'm working on is a memoir. I'm writing a memoir about a year of, I have multiple pregnancy losses in a year and how they transformed me and how I live. And so I'm, I've been working on a memoir about that. I'm actually in the pretty late revision stages. And so, and I'm going to independently publish this to change paths. I'm really excited about it. And that I'm hoping to, to publish sometime in the next year. But writing that, mostly I typed it. And I don't know why, I just did. I mean, I basically followed what my instinct was. And my instinct this time was like, just to type. There definitely was a kind of sense of urgency to this story. Like I would say I definitely felt more of a sense of urgency with this book than I have with my previous. And I don't know why that might have lent itself to typing, but it did. I mean, I can see why it might have lent itself to typing. It's like typing. You can type faster than you can write, right? So I did find that with this one, it really poured out and I would go to the computer. That's what I found myself going toward was the computer, not the notebook. So no, I've like broke my own pattern. (laughs) And I would love to ask you about your choice to independently publish this book. Why did you decide to choose this path? So yeah, it's been really interesting. I never could, I, I never would have seen myself going this route, but I actually found when my eight, my literary agent and I were approaching publishers, some of them had ideas for the book, um, wanting to take it in a direction that was not what I wanted to do, like writing about fertility at large or writing more like cultural commentary. And I really was like, mm, I don't, I don't really want to do that. Like I want to do, I want to just write my story, like a very personal one woman's experience type thing, 
with the goal of reaching well, whoever wants to read it, of course, but the reader that I have in mind is someone who's going through that because that's what I wanted to read when I was going through that. That was one reason. And then another reason is that I wanted a much shorter timeline. So the traditionally public traditional publishing timeline is so long. Like I didn't realize until it happened to me that the stand really it's more like it's kind of two years or even more from when you sign the book deal to when your book hits shelves to the point that sometimes my book would come out and someone would ask me something about it and I wouldn't remember writing it. So like, (laughs) that's a really long time. And this story that is in my memoir is so personal that I couldn't imagine talking to readers about it in years, like, and feeling that way, like they are connected to the story in real time. And I have moved on. Like, I didn't, I didn't want that. That didn't feel good. And so I, I want it to feel right, right now. I'm still really connected to the story. I'm still working on it. I'm still polishing it. I'm working with an editor and I want to still feel like I'm in it when people read it so that we're talking on the same, we're on the same wavelength, you know? I know you're still in the revision phase, but has there been anything about indie publishing that surprised you so far? I'm so early. I don't know. I'm terrified of doing it. <laughs> but like, I'm, I mean, I'm sure I will have answers to that question later, but like, I'm just so early. I'm, I'm basically like just in the stage of working with an editor, trying to find a cover designer, if anyone knows anyone good. And then I've talked to friends who have done it. Like I've gotten, I feel like I've done my research to figure out what, what are the kind of the do's and don'ts, but I haven't yet done it myself. So it'll be an adventure. It's kind of overwhelming when you're first going into it because there's so many different opinions. There's so much stuff to research and look into. And then it's kind of all like you wearing the different hats. Yeah. But I do think that it makes sense for the choice that you're making with this memoir because indie publishing does really allow you to have full control over everything. And for such a personal story, I think it really makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I think it was a relief. It was a relief when I decided to do it because I thought, okay, good. I'm not going to have to turn this book into X, Y, Z. Like I can literally just do it the way that I want to. And that feels really good, you know? It's like the biggest perk of indie publishing that we hear is just complete creative control. Yeah. So just kind of going back to writing Coach Brain, do you have any book recommendations, not necessarily nonfiction, but any book recommendations for aspiring writers? My favorite ones are Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Those are my two favorite creative books. And then probably my favorite book on fiction writing is The Art of Fiction by John Gardner. It's really, really good. So those are all my tops. We'll make sure we link to those in the show notes so everyone can download. Oh, great. And just before we let you go and get on with your day, uh, where can listeners find you online? They can go to my website, which is maryadkinswriter.com. And it's Adkins with a D like dog. Or the book incubator, which is the pro- the bookincubator.com, um, which is the program that I run if they just want to specifically look uh, look up that program. And I'm also on Instagram as Adkins Mary, but I just post pictures of my kid there. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty domestic. <laughs> and I realized I forgot to ask this. With the book incubator, how often do new sessions begin? So people can join anytime. We enroll people every month. So then they can come in wherever they're starting. So they come in. First thing we do is have an onboarding meeting and figure out like, where are you in the process? Let's choose your next step. So yeah, it's open. Amazing. Well, we'll be sure to include links to your socials, to your websites, all that jazz on our website. And thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. This was great. It was super fun. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Cobra Writing Life podcast. If you're interested in picking up Mary's books or learning more about the Book Incubator, we will include links in our show notes. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're looking for more tips on growing your self-publishing business, you can find us at CobraWritingLife.com. Be sure to follow us on socials. We are at Kobo Writing Life on Facebook and Twitter and at Kobo.Writing.Life on Instagram. This episode was hosted by Rachel Wharton and Laura Granger with production by Terrence Abrahams. Editing is provided by Kelly Robotham. Our theme music is composed by Tearjerker. And huge thanks to Mary Adkins for being our guest today. 
If you're ready to start your publishing journey, sign up today at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.